Hi, I'm Lil. And I'm Fitz. And you're listening to Knock Once for Yes. What a month it has been. Unfortunately, as that which will not be named is still in full swing, we have very much been missing our usual adventures. We have, however, been delving into every resource we can think of to try and find some lovely remote and non peopley haunted ruins that we might be able to get out to and that we can visit safely. If anyone has any suggestions for a nice isolated spot we could check out, please do let us know. Often the best places are hidden local gems. I do apologise that we're a bit late with this episode. I've been working on my delicate little flower status by getting a bit of an infection and then feeling quite under the weather for a while as the course of antibiotics I was on made me feel a bit rough. That was closely followed by a nasty case of heat rash because for some reason the UK is now as hot as the sun. Obviously the best course of action is for us to hole ourselves up in the studio, close all the windows and doors and set up the blanket fort, let the PC heat up the room to something approaching the temperature of a supernova. But not to worry, the stories we have for you today are guaranteed to bring a chill to the room. Many thanks to those of you who've sent in questions for a second Q&A bonus episode. We've got some great questions and we're really excited to answer them. But if you haven't sent in your question yet, you've still got a little bit of time. So go ahead and pop them over to us. Now, Fitz, what have we got coming up on today's episode? This episode, it would seem that a global lockdown is the perfect time to sell your haunted house as we have another one on the paranormal radar. We have listener stories from Fox, Briar and Rosie, and we have another Haunted Holiday Paranormal postcard as Lil shares the second half of her spooky adventures in Dorset. But first, we want to say a huge thank you to all of our latest patrons. Kathy Garner. Elizabeth Duchenne. Elizabeth Lavoy. Kay. Kate Crew, April Richardson. And Mary Halprick. We'd also like to say a huge thank you to everyone who donated via coffee. Betsy. Nikim17. Egypt1968. And another anonymous donor. I love these anonymous benefactors. I know. (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) Thank you guys so much. Yes, thank you so much to all our patrons and coffee supporters, old and new, as we literally couldn't make the show without you. And we'd just like to apologise again for the delay in sending out physical patron rewards due to lockdown. We are posting things out now, but please bear with us if you haven't received yours yet. We had quite a lot to send out and we're doing it in batches so that we don't cause a two hour queue in our teeny tiny post office. For those of you eligible for paranormal postcards from our visits, you should have a haunted Dorset card winging its way to your post box as we speak. Now, Fitz, what have you got for me today on the paranormal radar? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it seems to be the time of year to sell haunted houses, as Loftus Hall, which is claimed to be Ireland's most haunted house, is up for sale. The 22-bedroom hall and associated 63 acres of land, including its own private beach, is up for a cool £2.5 million. And if you think that's a bargain, then don't forget to factor in the running costs, which are in the region of £250,000 a year as well. Oh, that just for the running costs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now, I must admit that after doing a little bit of research, I'm not sure exactly how Loftus Hall gained the title of the most haunted house in Ireland. There is an interesting tale that takes place there, to be sure. And there have been several sightings there, including some quite recent ones but it hardly seems overrun with ghosts. The most famous story is that of Anne Loftus, who invited a young man to take shelter at the hall after his ship sought shelter during a storm in nearby Slade Harbour. Anne was quite taken with the handsome stranger, and it's said that he stayed for several days there with Anne. He was, however, to make a rather startling exit one night during a game of cards. Having dropped one of the cards, Anne bent down to pick it up and happened to notice that her guest had cloven hooves in place of feet. On realising that he'd been rumbled, 
the man burst through the ceiling in flames, leaving a hole which remains today. Apparently Anne, who was rather shocked and is said to have lost her grip on her sanity, then either retreated or was locked away in one of the rooms where legend tells she sat with her knees drawn up to her chin for so long she was unable to straighten herself again. She was even said to have been buried sitting in this position. It certainly doesn't take much effort to poke holes in this story, but staff are reported to have witnessed her ghost walking around the hall at night following her death. A local priest was even brought in to exercise the hall, but it appears that he may have been unsuccessful as the sightings continued, with a recent visitor having seen a ghostly lady walking the grounds and another who saw the figure of an old lady in one of the upstairs windows. That is very, very spooky, but I have to just mention here, in case the listeners can hear it, a thunderstorm has just started up in the background, and I'm beginning to feel like this episode is not meant to be made. Honestly, ever since we were ready to record, Fitz has got sick three times. Mm -hmm. We've had a gigantic load of roadworks outside of our house. Literally, before we started this episode, we were like, it's Sunday, they can't possibly be doing anything today. We sat down to record and then we started hearing things. Luckily, it was them removing the cones and the traffic lights and things. But but we've been waiting for them to stop work for a week. And then literally, as we sat down to record, we thought they were back. Now they've gone. Now we've got thunder in the background. So if you you do hear it, it's not an effect I've put in. It is actual thunder. But we're going to carry on because we are going to get this episode recorded. And it does suit the mood, so well, let's yes. just roll with it. Yeah, let's let's go with the naturally spooky sound effects. But anyway, I'm so sorry if it's getting back to your paranormal radar. That's fine. I mean, this was, I mean, like I said at the start, I, I looked into it and it's called the most haunted house in Ireland, blah, blah, blah. But this was pretty much the only story I could find. It's such a famous story, though. And I think that's what it is. Rather than being, you know, like an, an abundance of ghosts, mm. this is such a famous story. I think it's more like the most famously haunted house in Ireland. Yeah. That, that's how I would look at it. Because I, when you were reading this, I was like, I know this story. Mm-hmm. But off the top of my head, I can't remember whether I know this story because it's just so famous or whether it's one of those stories that you tend to find all over the world. And it's one of those that's just kind of become its own entity, if you know Mm. what I mean. You do find some of those, like in England, you tend to find the ghostly Piper stories where there's secret, we've covered one of them Mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, But the more you look, the more you realise that the same tale has popped up in lots and lots of different locations, that there's haunted tunnels and a a Piper, or sometimes it's a violinist or something Mm -hmm. disappears in these tunnels and i think this might be one of those stories i think you may find it in more than one place but i would i would need to check that i I got the impression that the young lady of the hall had become rather enamored with the sailor Mm -hmm. and things had happened Mm -hmm. out of wedlock and that it was a you know whatever the the servants had told to spread the story and yeah it seems to have got out of hand that's my impression it's definitely implied that they had a romantic relationship yeah and that was the thing that made me Im- immediately think hang on a sec if they're supposedly you know been involved been involved how has she only noticed that he's got cloven hooves for feet when they're playing cards <laughs> playing cards <laughs> is that a euphemism no i'm sure i'm sure you're right and you find this in a lot of stories actually um you know somebody local has sort of been caught out doing something that was ill thought of at the time and it's Mm -hmm. the person involved has been sort of given this devilish otherworldly evil kind of countenance just to kind of yeah so i I get the impression she's done something for the time improper Mm -hmm. and her parents have locked her away in the hall yeah which is quite possible unfortunately and she's for her lost love and you know the the tale has kind of spread that yeah. this disaster has happened she's lost her mind and you know just because of gossip and yeah. things but it does seem to have inspired an actual ghost mm-hmm. because people have seen her walking the halls and people you know even up to recently the, the stories i provided were were quite recent yeah so it does seem that there is something going on there. I'm not sure about cloven hooved people exploding into balls of flame through the ceiling, but... <laughs> no, but certainly it wouldn't be outside the realm's possibility that she was locked up by her parents for doing something thought of at the time as being improper. And, you know, with a traumatic event like that, it's 
it's no wonder, really, if she is still haunting the place. But yeah, two and a half mil, you fancy it? Oh, yeah, pocket, <laughs> pocket money, darling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, bearing in mind the annual running costs are more than our house is worth. <laughs> a lot <laughs> more. <laughs> <laughs> Pop it on the bucket list. And with that, I think we'll move on to our first listener story of the episode. And this one is from Fox. I'd first like to say that I'm a very sensitive person. I've been seeing things and experiencing the strange and unexplained since I can remember. Because of this, I have many stories, but today I'll share two. The first happened in Fort Collins, Colorado. I was visiting this calm and cosy town for a high school championship competition. On the last day of the competition, my mum and dad decided to surprise me with a ghost tour of the town. We'd always loved investigating the paranormal together. The tour took us through the historic district and then down to the town tunnels. These tunnels are long and winding, and they cover most of the old town and connect many of the businesses. Throughout the town's history, they were used as a delivery system for shops, speakeasy entrances, a Cold War bunker, a morgue, and even a jail during the 1880s. This was to keep disease from spreading. There is even an 18-inch thick solitary confinement cell dug into the rock. Everything was quite calm until we entered the large room that was used as the morgue and jail. As with any place so wreathed in death, I entered the room and immediately felt sick. I have slight claustrophobia, but had been walking through the narrow passages and smaller rooms without incident. I was so bothered that I asked my mum if we could leave, as I was going to throw up. She led me to the back of the room, and threw some breathing exercises to calm me down. I rejoined the group as the guide was taking out an EMF detector. He and a couple of other people in the group walked around with it for a bit and recorded bass readings. The device stayed relatively quiet, and then it was passed to me. The lights jumped up to halfway up the meter and stayed there. The guide laughed and said something about me having an electric personality. I handed it to my father and it stopped. He handed it back to me and it lit up again. Then everyone in the group got very curious. They all wanted to ask me questions or have me walk around with the device. I took a step towards the centre of the group to hand the device back to the guide when the lights lit almost to full intensity. I stopped dead and got queasy again. With the EMF in my outstretched hand, I started to trace the source as I'd seen done before in TV shows and on other investigations. I raised my hand high until it was almost a foot above me and the light diminished. I went all the way to the floor, and then to either side, until the light went back to the middle. I realised quite soon in the process that I was tracing a figure. The guide looked shaken and approached me for the device. I handed it back, and the meter went all the way down to the base reading again. Alright, let's head out, the guide said, and started corralling the group towards the rest of the tour. A few group members were already down the passageway, and my family and I and the guide were just about to exit the room when I saw in the corner something I will never forget. A dark mass, tall and wide, stepped out of the corner. It had no eyes, but I still knew it was staring right at me. I backed up fast into the tour guide and screamed, the next thing I knew, I was on the ground. I'd passed out, and the guide had caught me. The group had come rushing back at my scream, and now milled about the room, waiting to make sure that I was okay. I drank some water and slowly got up. My eyes went straight to the corner of the room again, but there was nothing there. 
The next story happened a week ago while I was babysitting in southern Colorado. It was last minute and I had never been in the house beforehand. It was a very large, remodeled 60s family home on a hill surrounded by open space full of blackberries and sumac. The house had a ground floor, a small attic loft and a basement. I had no occasion to be anywhere other than the main floor. The children, let's call them Liv and Joseph, are four and six, respectively. They're extremely well-behaved children, and we got along very well. At around 7.30, I'm preparing them for bed, and I'm leading Liv to Joseph's room where she wanted to sleep for the night. We pass the open staircase to the basement, and Liv looks down it and then waves while smiling. I look down the stair, but see nothing, so brush it off as childishness. After everyone's in bed, I go to the living room and read while I wait for their mum to return. And just a couple of minutes in, I hear skittering as if the kids are playing with their Legos. I get up and walk towards their room, and both look asleep on the bunk bed, so I head back to the living room. Not five minutes later, I hear a little girl humming. It sounds almost exactly like Liv, and I yell down the hall, Go to bed! And the humming stops for a bit. Ten minutes later, the skittering starts again, and the humming. I said go to bed, I say as I'm walking down the hall. As I approach their door, I see that they are both in bed. I go and grab my book and a chair from the dining room and seat myself in the hall outside their room so that I can watch them closely. Almost a half hour goes by and I'm relaxing into my reading and then I hear the skittering again. I look up and the kids are in bed. I look around thinking maybe it's mice running around the room and the hallway and as I get up to investigate further I hear the humming. A voice, exactly like Liv's, coming from the basement. I don't even take the time to move the chair. I bolt to the living room and text their mum to ask how much longer she'll be. And I wait. The humming gets louder and louder until it's near the entrance to the living room. And then stops abruptly as their mother walks in through the front door. I leap from my seat, grab my things, say a quick update on the kids and practically run out of the house. I will never go into that house again. Oh, thank you for that thought, because I'm not surprised you ran out of the house. I wouldn't have been far behind you. And I have to wonder just how many babysitters that particular family gets through, because I'm guessing there may be quite a high turnover. Yeah, there is something about little girl ghosts. And it's interesting that the daughter could obviously see it and yeah. was waving at it like, hello, like copy of me or whatever it was. that. Yes. Was... So the children weren't scared. No. But the the humming was imitating the little girl? That's mm-hmm. Unless that's odd. just, you know, the similarity of little girls' voices at that age. I don't know if I'd Possibly, be able to... Possibly. I don't mm. know. But there seemed to be something more that it was it was that similar. Yeah, a bit strange. And skitterers, that's the word we use for those creepy black things that yeah. skitter about. And, but here you've just quite... got the noise of sort mm. of skittering But around. that's how I imagine they sound. Mm. Like the yeah. fact that they're all <laughs> angular and too much. And they sort of creep about. And I imagine that they... So, so in your head, the scary black monstery skittery things that we saw at the old house sound like they're playing with Legos. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, maybe terrifying Legos. <laughs> the Legos of doom. <laughs> yeah, that that's kind of how I imagine they sound. <laughs> Going back to the um, Fort Collins in Colorado, that was really interesting with the EMF mm-hmm. detector um, because it seemed like it wasn't picking anything up for any of the other guests. Yeah, that is strange. So was it that the guests weren't walking through the same point or was it just that... Do you it, conduct it? Well, yeah, exactly. Like the ghost conductor? Or was the spirit attracted to Fox? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's why it suddenly started working? Yeah, it's strange. And the fact that it 
that feeling, I know that feeling that you've had when you said, I couldn't see any eyes, and, but I just knew it was looking at me. Yeah. I've had that before. Yeah. And I know precisely what you mean. Like, even if you can't describe a face, or even, like you say, that it didn't seem to have eyes or anything, you just know. But you can tell... that feeling. Exactly. You can tell sometimes when somebody's looking at you, even when you've got your eyes shut, Mm -hmm. can't you? There's that kind of... There's there's just that sense that eyes are on you. Uh, So it sounds like this isn't that unusual for you. The way you kind of phrase the intro makes me think that you've got a lot more stories. And we would love to hear them. But thank you for this one. It's been brilliant. They were amazing. I loved reading those. Thank you so much. Well, it's time now for our next listener story. And Lil's going to read this one from Briar. While I grew up believing in the paranormal and supernatural... And it's hard not to believe when you've seen small statues lifted into the air by an invisible hand and thrown clear across your living room. I'm a sceptic first. I always seek out a mundane explanation and only lean towards the paranormal after I've ruled everything else out first. There are still times when I don't realise something paranormal has happened until much later, however, because it seems so simple in the moment. My girlfriend Hilary and I attended a ghost tour in Boston in the summer of 2018. I highly recommend it to anyone visiting Boston. The walking tour gets you to the lesser known haunted locations, while also giving you a lovely history lesson about the facts behind the possible hauntings. Our tour started next to the old burial ground on Boston Common. Most visitors don't realise it's there unless they follow that path to the Boston Public Garden and even then, it's easily missed. It's very small. But it was also the meet-up location for our guide. We had arrived early as I was taught that on time is late for much of my life and we got a chance to have a chat with our guide. She was very excited and knowledgeable and asked us if we had any ghostly sightings of our own. Earlier that weekend, my girlfriend had stepped around a man she swore was walking towards us, but I told her no one was there. The guy's eyes lit up and started talking about the odd, unknown ghosts spotted on the common. Now, while I'm from Western Massachusetts, Boston is still a relatively new place to explore for me. I end up visiting the common a lot when I meet up with friends who are in Boston. Multiple times, I've seen women in colonial period dresses talking while sitting on a bench. A very good friend of ours works at the Boston Tea Party Museum, and I do know that there are tours given by tour guides in period costuming throughout the city, so I figured it was two women on a break. Of course... This is where I'd be proven very wrong by our tour guide. She told us stories of multiple visitors to Boston being very confused that two women in colonial period dresses would be seen sitting on the very same bench at the very same time of day, but with an interesting note. These people could tell that the women were talking, but heard no words from them. They also saw the women in monochrome, complete shades of grey. While we, at least Americans, think of colonial clothing as drab, it was actually incredibly vivid and full of tiny, intricate patterns over the cloth. I'm sure I froze. There was definitely silence, and I remember my girlfriend turning to me. I slowly chimed up that, yes... I'd actually seen those women and could hear them and saw them in full colour. I merely thought them guides. But it was the same place, the same time. And looking back, I wondered if that's why no one, not even the obvious tourists, were staring at the women. Maybe because no one else at the time could see them. I guess I'd seen more than a few unknown ghosts of Boston Common and had never realised it. It definitely wasn't the last time, and I know there are many ghosts there. It's just harder to pick them out from the crowds than you might think. 
Thank you, Briar, for that story. And you've hit on something that we've said quite a few times, is yeah. that I wonder how many times people see things like this and just don't realise that they're seeing a ghost. Absolutely. And I mean, it's happened to us. It happened to us when we were driving, I think a couple of times, in fact. I think we've both seen people as we've been driving along and not thought anything about it, except for the fact that it's been quite late at night. And so just as you're driving past, you get that kind of chiming in your brain like, oh, it's, you know, it's mm. really late. There's nobody else about. I wonder if they're OK. And looked back in the rear view mirror and there's nobody to be seen. Mm -hmm. It's an empty street. And I know that's happened to both of us and sort of been a catalyst to come to this conclusion of like, well, how many ghosts do we see day to day? And we just never realise. Yeah, it's an interesting one. And also you raise the point as to whether certain people can see them and others can't. Mm. And that's something that I find interesting. It's something that was brought home. I think we talked about this again recently Mm -hmm. with Thetford Priory. Mm -hmm where there was a group of people and they all saw something, but in varying degrees of, um, what's the word? How well formed it was. Yeah, like one of them just saw a sort of misty shape and another one saw a figure with stab wounds. And, you know, it was some, for some it was precise and for others it was just a vague... And I wonder if you might have somebody else that was there that wouldn't have seen anything at all. Yeah, exactly. And this is a perfect example, isn't it? Mm. You're seeing them in full colour. You're hearing voices. Other visitors are seeing them in monochrome. Yeah, that was an interesting point as well. Because you've seen, didn't you see something that was sort of monochrome? I have. I have in the past. Normally, no, most of the apparitions I've seen have just been looking like normal people in full colour. But yes, I have seen an apparition which was in shades of grey which is really unusual I remember being asked as a child actually because I remember telling my family that I'd seen something and oddly my my older brother's first reaction was was it full was it colour or was it in black and white that was Mm. his words it was in black and white and I can't remember what I said now but I just thought it was a really odd question to come out with so unless he'd seen something that was again that sort of monochrome I don't know but it does well maybe Mm. and I know that actually thinking about it now I think I remember him saying before that he doesn't dream in colour he dreams in black and white oh yeah I've heard that a few times from different people I'm pretty sure I dream in colour I know I dream in colour because because it's been mentioned to me in the past that other people haven't they they dream in black and white Mm. and I just thought it was so weird because I was like really I didn't know that you know I didn't know that that could happen I wonder if they're linked somehow yeah it's interesting Mm. do you dream in colour (laughs) Briar? we went down a little bit of a rabbit hole there and I (laughs) know I've heard of people that say listening to podcasts is a little bit like you know having a conversation with people and I was just sat there waiting for Briar to let us know whether she dreams in (laughs) colour bless you even we get carried away with it yeah. sometimes. So, you know, do let us know. It, and it is for us like having a conversation with you all, yeah. apparently. <laughs> oh, well, let's pull ourselves back out of that rabbit hole. And I think it might be time for another story. And this one is from Rosie. About 10 or so years ago, my husband, daughter and I were in Perth, Australia, and decided to visit the Fremantle Jail. The prison was built as a convict barracks in the 1800s by convicts, and shortly after became a prison, which was in continual use until 1991. I read that over 10,000 prisoners spent time there over the many years, and this included Bon Scott, the former lead singer of rock band ACDC. Anyway, it was a day tour, so not too spooky. Or so I thought. As we followed the guide around, my daughter began to feel unwell. She was around 15 at the time, and we thought that, as it was hot, she might be suffering from the weather, and gave her more water to drink. Then I started to feel a bit odd too, but we continued the tour and all was good. Until we came to the room where they used to hang the prisoners. My daughter was physically sick just outside the door and wouldn't go in. After making sure she was okay, we went in and it did have a horrible vibe, as expected, but nothing too dramatic. After the guy did his spiel, we went out to our daughter and, as that was the end of the tour, we made our way out of the prison. As you do, we chatted about the tour 
and I remarked to my husband that it was really tacky how they light at the bottom of the scaffold with a red light. He said, What light? There was no light. I swear I saw a red glow at the bottom, as if hell's light was glowing for the sinners. We picked up our speed as we walked away from the jail, and the further we got away from the jail the better both I and my daughter felt. My second story happened in a regional hospital, Mount Barker, in the Adelaide Hills. I'd had an operation and was recuperating in my single bedroom. The first night I was out of it. The second, I was a bit more alert, but blamed what I felt on pain meds. And the next night, I was almost back to normal only on light pain medication, so I couldn't blame them. I was ready to go to sleep, rolled on my side and turned the light off, and I felt someone rubbing the side of my thigh in a soothing, nursey manner. I quickly flicked the light on and the room was empty. Okay, I thought, slowly settled myself down again and turned off the light but left my finger on the switch. As before, the rubbing started again, and quick as a flash, I turned the light on again, and again an empty room greeted me. I lay there for a little while, and then said to the room, Thank you for comforting me, but I'd appreciate it if you stopped. I need to get some sleep. I resettled myself, turned off the light, finger still on the switch, but nothing happened and I was able to sleep. The next morning, as I wandered the hospital grounds, I got talking to a nurse. I mentioned what had happened the night before, and he asked me what room I was in. I told him, and a slow, knowing smile crept across his face. Ah, yeah, he said. Other patients in that room have often had the same experience. Oh, I love that you got confirmation at the end there from the staff that you're not the only one to have experienced this. And Rosie, I have to commend your presence of mind to not get freaked out in the moment in that hospital room and just say quite calmly, thank you very much for the comfort, but I would like to go to sleep now. And you'd be surprised how many times that works. I was just going to say exactly that, that it does seem that that quite often works. Just, you know, you're disturbing me, please leave me alone. And a lot of the time it stops. But it did seem like it wasn't... um, Malicious. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Like... I liked the description of a nursey sort of feeling, perhaps Mm -hmm. possibly um, a previous member of staff that just wanted to continue comforting patients. And again, it does seem like both yourself and your daughter have a kind of sense that not necessarily everybody else does. That's a good point, actually, because the daughter got sick to start with, didn't they? Before Mm -hmm. they even went in the room and realised that it had not a very nice atmosphere. And this comes back to what we were talking about the other episode about weather this sort of sensitivity runs in families. Yep, and as we were talking earlier in this episode about how different people have different sort of perception of things, so it does seem that she got it, you you both had it, but she had it stronger than you. Just a little bit before. Mm -hmm. And then the light at the bottom of the scaffold, it's kind of, you know, what do you make of that? I don't know, it's really weird. Mm -hmm. Um, But it does, again, from what we just said about how people experience different levels and see different things obviously Rosie was seeing something there that nobody else noticed so what she was seeing though Mm. I don't know that is a very strange one very strange well thank you to Rosie and thank you to everyone that shared their story with us they really are at the center of what this show is all about and we're always thrilled whenever we see a new story in our inbox if you've had a paranormal experience we would love to hear about it And you can share your story by visiting our website at knockonceforyes.com. And in fact, every single listener who sent in a story today did mention in their emails that they had more stories to share. So we are absolutely very excited to hear the rest of your stories whenever you choose to send them in. We can't wait. Now, I'm afraid that is all the listener stories we've got time for today. But don't worry, show's not over yet. It's time to kick off your shoes, grab a cool drink, 
and settle in for this episode's Paranormal Postcard. Last episode, we travelled down memory lane to pay a visit to Corfe Castle and a childhood holiday that left a big impression on me in terms of the paranormal. And this episode, we're actually staying in Dorset a little while longer because Corfe wasn't the only haunted place we visited that year. And despite its hundreds of years of history and plethora of ghost stories, it wasn't even the spookiest location of that trip. But before we leave Corfe Castle behind us, we've got one more ghostly sighting to share. Not in the ruins themselves this time, but in the village nestled below in the shadow of the castle. Last time we told you the story of Lady Banks, and we got a glimpse into the impact the English Civil War and the fighting between Cavaliers and Roundheads had on the area, and how the village was rocked, quite literally, by the explosions set by parliamentarians set on destroying Corfe Castle and everything it stood for. Well, Cromwell's men may have wished to be rid of all reminders of its royalist enemies, but it seems that some have lingered there, even to this day, for this ghost sighting is very recent indeed. It was May of 2009 when a local man spoke to the Bournemouth Echo newspaper about what he had witnessed in the village of Corfe Castle. The witness was a keen angler and often searched for worms to use as fish bait on the village playing field when the conditions were right. And so, in the very early hours of one suitably damp morning, the witness set out to the playing field in search of bait. He soon became engrossed in his task, shining his torch at the ground looking for worms, and so he was surprised when, upon glancing up, he saw a tall figure standing in the middle of the field. The initial surprise came because the time was about 1.30am, so he wasn't expecting to see anyone else up and about at this hour. But as he looked closer, his surprise deepened. The tall figure appeared to be wearing a long cloak with a tall collar and a small floppy-brimmed hat. In the witness's own words, he described it as looking just like a cavalier. During the Civil War, the word cavalier was a popular term used by parliamentarians to describe their royalist opposition, and it was not a term of endearment. At the time, the word cavalier had developed a derogatory meaning, being used as an insult to mean braggart or swaggerer. The parliamentarians thought the fashion of King Charles's followers to be ostentatious and unnecessary, and even today, the word cavalier more often than not conjures up the image of a glamorously dressed 17th century gentleman, with stockinged legs, swishy cape, and floppy brimmed felt hat capped with an ostrich feather. But despite the witness's attribution of the cavalier aesthetic to the apparition, his sketch of what he witnessed seems to me to be slightly at odds with this. The newspaper article contained a drawing made by the witness of the figure he saw, and whilst it certainly doesn't look like anything a modern person would wear, it doesn't quite strike me as the classic cavalier outfit either. The figure looks to be wearing some kind of extremely long outer garment that practically sweeps the floor. Sleeves are visible, so it's maybe more of a coat than a cloak, and the collar is indeed high and very prominent. The hat seems smaller and more compact than the ostrich feathered hat that I would expect. In fact, it gives me the impression of a costume from an earlier period. The smaller hat almost looks like a Tudor bonnet. The ankle length coat could possibly be a box coat, and the prominent collar hints at a tall ruff. Of course, we're far from historical fashion experts, and the witness is not much of an artist. But I thought it was interesting, because with all the Civil War tales from the area, you might think it would be easy to see a glimpse of something unexplained, and for your mind to fill in the blanks with what you might expect to see, based on local stories and depiction of cavaliers from television and the media. But despite the witness using the word cavalier in his description, what he's drawn is something quite a bit more distinctive, and possibly from a period in history he's not very familiar with, so that doesn't speak to me of a brain filling in the blanks of a shadowy figure with well-known imagery. 
that suggests to me that he had a very good look at it indeed. But, cavalier or not, what happened to our apparition, and indeed our witness, who we left frozen in torchlit surprise in the dark of the village playing field? Well, not one to be easily put off his task, he turned back to his worm hunting for some moments, although keeping a mind to the tall figure which had so mysteriously appeared. And so he soon glanced up again for another look, only to find that the figure had vanished. The local man said he wasn't frightened, but was puzzled as to where the figure could have disappeared so quickly. It was a long stretch to the nearest cover of bushes, and the mysterious stranger would have had to have run at full tilt to reach them before the angler had glanced up again to find him gone. In finishing, the witness adds that this isn't the first instance of something unexplained occurring on the playing field, and notes how other villagers have heard the sound of a gate opening and closing when there's nobody else around. In truth, I can't remember the village too well from our visit, and I'm not sure that we explored much of the area around the castle. Although, my mum and younger brother decided that they hadn't quite worn themselves out yet, and wanted to climb the exhaustingly tall-looking hill opposite the castle. The rest of us declined the unnecessary exertion, and I never did see what was at the top of that hill, and I wouldn't realise its significance until later. Many years later, in fact. But for now, we will leave Corf Castle behind us, for what would a trip to Dorset be without a visit to the seaside? And visit it we did, along with the many ghosts that the Jurassic Coast has to offer. The stretch of coastline from Old Harry Rocks in Dorset to Exmouth in East Devon is known as the Jurassic Coast and is England's first and only natural world heritage site. Despite the name of Jurassic Coast, the reason for the coastline's fame is actually that the coastal erosion eating into the cliffs has exposed a slew of stunning geological examples representing the best of the entire Mesozoic period, made up of the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. The dinosaur nerd in me has to pause here momentarily to note how peculiar it is that this coastline representing those three periods in history got landed with the title Jurassic Coast. Much like the Jurassic Park franchise was founded on a selection of dinosaur species also representing all three eras, with the majority actually being from the Cretaceous. Is it just that Jurassic sounds cooler or what? Anyway, <clears throat> I digress. Fitz is giving me the look. I'll put Dino Nerd back in her box. Name aside, this is the only place in the world that you can view this geological walk through time spanning 185 million years of the Earth's history in such a way, with one of the most dramatic sites being Stair Hole in West Lulworth. Here you can see what's known as the Lulworth Crumple, an incredible example of geology where the once flat sedimentary rocks have been lifted, tilted and twisted by the movement of the Earth's crust resulting in fantastic patterned bands of rock strata and looking for all the world like a giant has reached up a hand from beneath the earth, grabbed a fistful of rock and scrunched it up like tissue paper. This is a landscape where the fossilised remains of ancient sea creatures literally fall out of the cliffs and we spent many happy hours fossil hunting on the beaches, finding the shadows of ammonites in overturned stones dipping our hands into rock pools and finding belemites, bivalves and devil's toenails, creatures that once swam the dark leagues of the Cretaceous oceans, now and forever committed to stone. How long had they lain hidden deep within the crumbling cliffs before we discovered them? We wondered at the impossibility of holding such ancient beasts in our youthful hands. Not far from Stairhole is Lulworth Cove, famous for its naturally formed semicircular shape and brilliant blue waters, appearing almost turquoise against the white chalk cliffs. 
and a little further along the coast is Durdle Door, another impressive example of the Jurassic Coast's dramatic geology, a natural arch carved out of a limestone promontory jutting out into the sea. The door-like opening having been carved away by the slow but endlessly hungry power of the sea. But for all its geological wonder and raw beauty, this stretch of coastline has seen its fair share of bloodshed. After all, the secluded coves of the Jurassic coast are lapped by waves of the English Channel and would have provided the perfect landing site for would-be invaders. So you may well expect that the inhabitants of Lulworth throughout history would have put some defensive positions in place with just such a threat in mind, and you would not be wrong. In fact, the oldest known fortification in that immediate area is an Iron Age hill fort known as Bindon Hill, and in the Iron Age, the biggest threat to the native Britons were Roman invaders. It wasn't until the second wave of the Roman conquest of Britain that General Vespasian led his legion into Dorset. But once the Romans arrived in the summer of AD 44, the soldiers made short work of taking the native fortifications, including Abbotsbury Castle, Maiden Castle, Badbury Rings, Hod Hill, and Spetsbury Rings Hill Fort. Many historians think that the Roman takeover was largely peaceful, but the mass grave of over 100 individuals unearthed at Spetsbury Rings in the 19th century suggests that not every Briton was so keen to come under Roman rule. Of the hill fort at Bindon Hill specifically, we have no written record of just what occurred between the natives and the invading force. I suppose it's a bit too much to ask for a written record of every skirmish when we're talking about events from nearly 2,000 years ago. But something surely happened to leave an indelible imprint on the ancient site, for even in modern times, when mist drifts across the white chalk cliffs, indistinct shapes can be seen in the fog, the hazy shapes of men moving in unison, maybe even soldiers marching. The sounds of rhythmic footfall can be heard drifting down from the hill, along with the thudding of horses' hooves, and the chinking clatter of armour. It's said that on these nights no dogs will venture forth. In fact, not even a rabbit can be seen on the lonely hill. We may never know what happened to these Roman soldiers to keep them returning to this ancient hill fort, but it seems that even the local wildlife knows to stay well away when the ghostly Roman soldiers march on Bindon Hill. It's posited by some paranormal enthusiasts that the presence of limestone, such as the rock found at Lulworth, may contribute to the stone tape effect, the theory that stone itself can record a moment in time, much like a videotape, to be replayed over and over again. Whatever you may think about this theory, it does seem that the ghosts around Lulworth appear to be reliving the same moment from history over and over again. One argument for the stone tape theory suggests that traumatic events may be more likely to imprint on the environment, and our next sighting would certainly qualify for this category. The witness of this disturbing sighting is told to have been a sailor who anchored near Durdle Door, when he was startled to hear screams and shrieking. Looking for the source of the noise, he is said to have witnessed a group of ethereal girls rise from the water before disappearing into thin air. The explanation for this local legend has always been that the phantom girls were maidservants at nearby Lulworth Castle, who fled a devastating fire when the castle caught ablaze, congregating at the beach thinking that they had reached safety, only to be sadly swept out to sea. It's unclear why this connection to the servants of Lulworth Castle has been made, as although the 17th century fortified hunting lodge is in the same area, it's actually some way inland, and perhaps not the most obvious origin for the unfortunate apparitions. However, it was ravaged by a catastrophic fire in 1929, 
so maybe there is more to this local ghost story than we know, and the details have simply been lost in decades of retelling. Our next coastal apparition is perhaps even more unlikely, as this phantom is none other than Napoleon Bonaparte. Apparently witnesses have spotted him at Durdle Door puzzling over a map. This is an odd one, because as far as I could discover, Napoleon never did sail to the Dorset coast, at least not in real life. He did, however, make a brief landing at Lulworth Cove in a short story by Thomas Hardy called A Tradition of 1804. This fictional tale features a made-up local witness who claimed to have seen Napoleon come ashore in the dead of night, but apparently Hardy's storytelling was so convincing that some locals thought the witness was real. Hardy had grown up in the county of Dorset, so maybe it was the fact that he was a local that confused matters, but whatever the reason, his story about Napoleon's landing accidentally went down in local legend as a real-life encounter. It makes me wonder if the ghost story rose from this confusion. In Hardy's short story, one of the characters awakens to see Napoleon and a comrade consulting a map and seemingly checking out the lay of the land for a landing party. But apparently not much liking their proposed landing spot, Napoleon and his companion escaped swiftly into the night. The tale's protagonist, regretting his lack of a flintlock in the moment, duly reported the sighting to the authorities, but nothing ever came of it, and Napoleon never returned with his fleet. Now, to back up a bit and return to our reported ghost sighting, the only details I could find were that an apparition resembling Napoleon is seen in the area of Durdle Door. The figure appears to be consulting a map, which, with a rueful shake of his head, he folds away before the figure vanishes. To me, this sounds suspiciously like Hardy's tale, and I wonder if the story, so often mistaken for fact, has somehow settled into local legend as a ghost story perhaps as a way of reconciling the muddling of fact and fiction. It certainly sounds awfully reminiscent of the short story. On the other hand, I suppose, how are we to know that the writer's tale wasn't based on a local ghost story to begin with? Unfortunately, the answer to that has been lost to history. I've often talked on this show before about how family holidays such as this inspired my love of the paranormal. And they were a wonderful holidays. We hardly ever stayed in a hotel. Instead, my parents would rent a cottage and we'd zoom off in the Volvo estate, finding every castle, manor house, ruin or ancient site the locale had to offer. It wasn't unusual for us to see two different castles in the same day we would pack so much in. But sometimes... The places we stayed in were as interesting as the heritage sites we visited, and such was the case with this particular cottage in Dorset. And we're going to talk about that some more momentarily, but first, to set the scene a little, I need to tell you about one more place we visited that trip. And it's a bit of an odd one too, the most haunted place that wasn't. It's Parnham House. I don't think that Parnham House has ever been a particularly well-known heritage site in Dorset, largely because it wasn't open to the public very long at all. The year that we visited the area just happened to fall into a small window of time during which the then current owners had broken the mould of those before them by opening parts of the house to visitors. Twenty odd years ago when we saw the house, it looked every bit the centrepiece of a BBC costume drama, from the outside at least. Manicured gardens, expansive lawns, shaped topiary standing like regimental soldiers in arrow straight formation. A curved drive made for horse-drawn carriages, dropping off lords and ladies in a show of ball gowns and impeccable etiquette. The kind of house that has dual staircases sweeping down towards each other, just for visual effect. The sort of house 
that has separate wings. It began life in the 1400s, although the oldest parts remaining today date back to the 16th century. It was a stately home for hundreds of years, passing through several different families all the way up to the 1920s, when it became a country club. The house boasts some impressive guests such as the Prince of Wales and Arthur Conan Doyle, who are both noted to have stayed there. By the time of the Second World War, Parnham had not been a family home for some years, and the building was requisitioned for the American Army. After the war, the house would serve as a nursing home between the 1950s and 70s. It was only in a brief period after this, and before it was sold back into private ownership in 2001, that the public were allowed through its doors for a glimpse inside. And as luck would have it, it was during this brief spell that we visited, during the time that John and Jenny Makepeace were using Parnham to establish their School for Craftsmen in Wood, a college training cabinet makers, as well as welcoming in the public for a look around. And this was the reason that we visited. My dad had a real fascination with woodworking and fine craftsmanship and wanted to see the examples of work from the college. The rest of us were always game for visiting an old stately home, so it seemed like the perfect choice. This was a long time ago now, so some of my memories are a little sketchy on the details of the place, but I remember that a lot of the interior was light, airy and rather modern looking in a way, which reflected the incredible furniture on display featuring the cabinet maker's work. So it didn't have that dark, gloomy pall to the decor that you find in some stately homes, and that can make the place feel a little closed in and even oppressive sometimes. This, by contrast, was a happy, light and busy place. Or at least, it should have been. But yet, from the moment we walked in, the atmosphere was like soup. Lead soup, in fact. It crawled over your skin and felt like it was hanging off you in sticky, claggy skeins. There was something wrong about the place, and I couldn't work out why. Sometimes you find in heritage sites that there are information boards pertaining to the place's gruesome or spooky history. Some even touch on the ghost stories that are almost inevitable of a place so old to set the scene for those seeking a chill alongside their history. But there was none of this at Parnham. In fact, I distinctly recall actually remarking the lack of such a thing at the time, almost conspicuous by its absence. It wasn't just me that felt it either. We all seemed to be getting jumpier by the moment as we toured the place. You would have thought that spilling out into the formal gardens might have eased the impression somewhat. But if anything, it was worse outside. At one point, I came across some worn stone steps that led down to a pool or a large pond. I came up abruptly, and just as abruptly, an entirely unbidden, a thought popped into my head. And that thought was, somebody drowned here. Thought isn't even the quite the right word. It wasn't a wondering, it was more of a knowing, a statement placed inside my brain. But for all my getting feelings and vibes from places, this sort of thing, this getting distinct impressions, words like that, it just didn't happen. Not to me. If I'd had the experience back then that I have now, I might have been more concerned about the effect the place seemed to have on us all. But at the time, I was just a kid. I didn't really understand what we were experiencing, and so we all just tried to brush it off. After all, it wasn't even supposed to be a haunted house. And my dad had been thrilled looking around at the woodwork and the furniture. In fact, I'm a bit of a fan of woodworking myself, And so from the gift shop, I bought a small carved wooden horse ornament as a souvenir. What happened next is a bit of a mystery to us all, even today. After that visit, and after the visit to Corfe Castle, things in the quaint little cottage we were staying in changed. 
When we'd first arrived, the barn conversion was warm and sunny and cosy. But at some point from here on, the place took on a different atmosphere. The family started getting agitated with one another. My dad took to having dark moods, none of which there seemed any obvious reason for. And then we started to hear noises. Now, memory, especially 20 or so year old memory, is a fallible thing. So I talked at length with my mum about what she remembered before sitting down to write this episode. And I also got in touch with the family friend who was staying with us that holiday at the cottage to see what he had to say about it. And we're going to bring you that conversation right now. My memory of it is, it, it's almost like watching a film that I'm not old enough to watch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's like, a pretty good way of describing uh, it. My my memory of it is quite exciting, but I can't remember why. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's, it's, it's so out of focus. Bit, it's almost, a, yeah, it is. I mean, this was 20 odd years ago, so it's not really surprising that we've got, well, I certainly have, bits of clear memories but it's like you say it's almost like flashes like you remember the highlights of a movie but you can't necessarily remember what knits it all together yeah yeah but the first thing I remember happening in the house was um mum running upstairs to where we all were in the bedroom in that sort of it was like an attic room I think wasn't it because it had that sloping yes. ceiling and she just kind of she thundered up the stairs which she never normally did anyway because my mum doesn't really get angry like that very often but she was fuming and she kind of burst into the room and went what are you doing and we were just we were just all sitting there reading I think we literally weren't even moving we hadn't moved for ages I think we all had a good book and we were just chilling and you know sitting around and we were like what nothing we, were, we weren't doing anything and um she said that it sounded like we were moving furniture around and all sorts and there was just these huge noises coming upstairs and coming from upstairs and she couldn't imagine what we were doing and she she really thought we were like rearranging the room or something yeah um, i can remember the um because i had a camp bed mm. and that that camp bed if i moved a little bit it was really creaky so like that may have been a factor with that with like the noise traveling down the stairs but there's no way it could have been enough for her to have such a reaction no and i remember we we kind of thought it was that at the time but now i think back on it this wasn't the first night of the holiday. This was yeah. days in, because I think we were there for two weeks. So this could have even been, I can't remember how far in, but it wasn't the first day. This was, we'd been to Corfe Castle, we'd been to Parnham. So it's at least the third day, if nothing else. So you'd been using that camp bed that whole time. And we kind of, because we were frightened, I think, I remember that at the time we wrote it off as like, oh, it must be the creaky camp bed. Ha, ha, ha. Let's, you know, <laughs> laugh it off and not think about it. But yeah. why would it suddenly start making more noise <laughs> by, you know, <laughs> several days in when you'd been using that same bed since we got there, since the very first day? That doesn't, you know, looking back on it now, that doesn't make any sense. Had you spoken to your mum about what she said she heard? No, it was... I don't think we did. I mean, a lot of what I know from what my mum experienced came out later. And Rob, I don't know whether you've actually, I, you know, you haven't spoken to my mum about it, so I don't I've, know how much yeah, of I this you know. I don't see her very often nowadays. <laughs> no. So she did admit to me later that at the time they heard footsteps and they'd hear footsteps because I think they had like an ah. ensuite bathroom or a downstairs bathroom and we had an upstairs one. Yes. So yeah, when they were in the toilet they'd hear somebody walking down the passageway to the toilet and they'd think it was us and it would turn out that we were all upstairs and there was nobody there. Um, she also said that like my dad w had just taken to having these like moods. And again, this didn't, it wasn't from the start of the holiday. This is the, the point that I'm kind of coming to looking back on it now. None of this began when we got there. This was several days in and all of a sudden they're just... People started being irritated and getting at each other. And dad started having these, you know, moody spells for no apparent reason. And I think at the time I was surprised that she took us so seriously when we talked to her about it and said, look, we've got to, you know, <laughs> some things have happened. We need to get rid of this horse. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> and obviously she'd been having a lot more things going on than we realised at the time. 
So that was the first thing I remember was her running upstairs and telling us off basically for doing something we weren't doing. Was What was the first thing that really, that you remember? Was there anything I'm missing to that or was it then just that night with the horse and the noises? I mean, I, I can barely remember anything about that holiday. Um, I can remember we went to Morrison's and we had tiramisu <laughs> at the Morrison's. <laughs> which is quite a random memory to just stick in my brain. Um, but like Parnham, it's, it's like a dream. I, I can remember almost, almost like looking at it from a third person perspective. Yeah. Um, and I, I can remember the conical hedges yeah, in the garden. Yeah, the topiary, um, yeah. I can remember where we bought the wooden horse. Because yeah. there was there was like a stall that had lots of lots of little wooden things, and for some reason you just went straight over to this horse and picked I it know. up and, and bought that one straight away. And there was just there was no choosing or anything; you just picked it straight up. And if anyone doesn't know Lil very well, that's not something that Lil does. No, it's she not make actually. Decisions quite, easily. <laughs> yeah, I don't, especially about choosing things in shops. I think I've probably talked about it on the show before, but I do have quite bad OCD. So choosing, like picking things up in a shop is actually my personal nemesis. I don't, I, it can take hours. Sometimes I have to have help. It's just not pretty. So that is unusual. I hadn't, I do remember feeling specifically drawn to it, but I hadn't remembered that part about me just sort of zoning in on it. So that's quite interesting to, to get that from you. Yeah, there's not, there's, there's really not much more I can remember about the house itself um, other than there was something, something about, about the garden, um, the garden area just not being very nice. It seemed to be worse than the house. Yeah, yeah, I felt that as well. And just, just a, a really weird atmosphere. And I remember that we were getting really jumpy uh, nothing like there was yeah. a, a person walking around in a raincoat and for some reason that freaked us out and I don't know I don't know why we were getting so wound up about things um it didn't make any sense we were really on edge just and there doesn't seem to be a reason for it yeah other than that um then it's just we got back to the cottage and I can remember a little bit of the thing with your mum where she came bursting in mm. and then after after that I can remember um we were we were trying to work out why everything felt weird yeah and one of us was holding the horse and the tail was moving mm -hmm. yeah so um this wooden horse that i bought um it was a little carved wooden horse but it, they'd they'd put i don't know whether it was horse hair probably not real horse hair but some straw or hair like yeah, stuff like, into the tail like brush kind of yeah. material yeah just a, a little brush tail was sort of inserted in um and yeah it was almost like static you know when you get those oh what are those static electricity balls called the van de graaff generators. van de graaff generators yes um <laughs> and if you put your hair near them or if you mm -hmm. put your hair near a rubbed balloon you know a static rubbed yeah. balloon yeah. then it rises up it was almost a bit like that it was just the hair of the horse started moving up and down yeah it was quite almost pulsating mm -hmm. which i guess you could think of all manner of reasons, like scientific reasons for it happening, but we were indoors, so there was no wind or anything like that. And as far as we knew, there was no like strong electrical fields or anything like that in the area. No, but do you remember the compass? So we were indoors, there was no storm, it wasn't raining, was it? It wasn't, you know, atmospheric, it didn't feel like there was... Um, press, air pressure or anything like that. We weren't going to have a storm. Um, and then the tail of the horse just started moving. And like as you say, we were already feeling like things were a bit off mm. anyway. Um, and I don't, I don't know why I did this. It actually makes sense now, knowing what I know about the sort of roots and development of paranormal investigation. But I didn't know any of that then, so I have no idea why I thought of this. But I pulled out my hiking compass. I <laughs> And I put it next to the horse. But the thing is, it started spinning as if it was something, you know, metal or magnetised. <laughs> this is a wooden horse. When you say spinning, do you mean just con like in a sort of revolving? No, or it, was, just it was kind of going round nearly, uh, you know, 360 degrees and then coming back again and then going round and then coming back again. 
sort of swinging backwards and forwards, I suppose, rather than spinning is a better way of putting it. So almost like something with an alternating current where it would reverse the poles. Yeah, more like that. So it'd flip yeah. north, south, north, uh-huh. and it wouldn't ever settle. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't um, regular enough to be that, if you know what I mean. Mm. It was more... It well, if it wilder. was current, you know, you're talking thousands of changes a second, so oh, okay. registered like that. I was just wondering whether it was, you know, just constantly spinning, which would be very no, strange. You'd no. need a sort of constant input to do that, or whether it was flicking back and forth. No, or... it was it was kind of swinging backwards and forwards. So that didn't make any sense because this was just there was nothing else around. We were holding it at this point. We were in the middle of the room, so it wasn't near anything electrical um it wasn't stormy there wasn't lightning so we've got this kind of static effect with the tail and then this weird effect with the compass which again i don't really know why i thought of that but then of course we got even more freaked out because (laughs) (laughs) we couldn't work out what was happening there and then the crying started yeah so from out of nowhere it seemed this sound of crying just started up and we all just looked at each other because we were petrified. That that is that sound is just so stuck in my head. Yeah, it was um, not nice. <laughs> yeah. So the next day, we went went to the field, and there was a scrap car there that had some kittens in it. Or was mm-hmm. it just one kitten? No, it was it was a, think, like a I was going to say a batch of kittens, a litter of kittens. <laughs> I can remember. I can only really remember one kitten. It might have That's been one that Fraser liked no, it's <laughs> or something. It, I bonded but, with one. I wanted to take it home and I yeah, wasn't Yeah, that allowed. might have been what it was. Yeah. So that that's the only one that stuck in my brain. But mm. um, but I'd af- afterwards I'd kind of attributed that noise to to the cats, just we assuming it was them crying out, kind of in distress at being stuck in the car. Yeah. But but the more I think about the sound that I heard. There's no way that was cats. No. Well, the thing is, was... at the time, neither of us had owned cats, had we? Um, no. Because, yes, yeah, this was a very long time ago. We didn't have cats growing up. But, yeah, at the, when we were hearing it, and it, we didn't have an open window or anything, I don't think, either. So it was loud. It was coming in through the walls, you know. It, it wasn't coming in through an open <laughs> mm. And when window. you say crying, like, what, what? So are we talking yes. baby or like? Good question. Wailing. Yeah, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, I've heard a fox at, at that time of my life. Even mm. I'd heard a fox. Foxes, you know, you get some countryside noises that sound absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Barn owls. Fo- foxes that, cry, can sound like a baby crying, yeah, and that is they absolutely chilling. Can. Yeah. No, I've heard a fox um, call before. Barn owls sound absolutely terrifying. Mm-hmm. Hedgehogs. It, yeah, even even frogs can make some awful noises, but it just wasn't any of those things. Mm. It, it yeah, wailing is a, is a good word. To, I don't know how else to say it. It was just chilling, and I wouldn't say it was a child or that kind of. It, it wasn't. It didn't sound like a baby child kind mm. of noise, and it just seemed to come from well nowhere we could pinpoint. That was the weird thing. Any of you got Irish blood? When, are we talking about a banshee? <laughs> no, not. I it was more lamenting than that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't feel like it was that kind of banshee wail. It was a lamenting sound. Mm. Do you think, Rob? Would how would you describe it? Wailing is the, <laughs> the only adjective yeah. I can think of for it. It it didn't sound like it came from anywhere. It sounded like it was coming from everywhere. Uh huh. And if it was outside, like like you said, the the building we were in, like it had, it was quite a well made, um, like a barn conversion, and mm-hmm. it had quite thick walls, and it was double glazed and well insulated, and yeah, so it, I, I don't think it could have been anything outside to make it sound like it was everywhere. No, but also I I do seem to remember that we did open the window, think you know, trying to pinpoint it, and it yeah. just. That's you know that we couldn't we couldn't mm. tell where it was coming from, and I th- we just kind of sat petrified until morning. 
<laughs> because you know, we'd, I think we'd like flung the, the this wooden horse that was apparently el- somehow electrified in the corner of the room and just kind of pulled the covers over our heads and just went, "Go away, go away, go away! I don't want to know." <laughs> and waited for the light. Um, but yeah, as Rob said, the next morning, um, I can't remember how we figured it out. I think the owners of the barn conversion cottages had come and they'd found these kittens in this abandoned trailer or something like that. And they were basically asking us if we wanted to take one Mm. home, which I did, but I wasn't allowed, sadly. And we went, oh, well, that must have been it. You know, we were were hearing the kittens crying because Mm. they'd been abandoned by their mother. That makes perfect sense. Wrote it all off. However, we kind of knew it wasn't that. I mean, it's a really, it's a really convenient excuse. Like the the camp, the creaky camp bed was a really convenient excuse for the sound of furniture moving around when really that doesn't make sense. And this wailing sound, like I know now from having had a litter of kittens, I've literally lived with a litter of kittens at the end of the bed and they don't make a noise like that. And <laughs> you, you've had kittens since then as well, haven't you, Rob? And yeah, yeah. That's just not a noise they make. I mean, they make some funny noises. <laughs> and they do, then they cry and, you know, they squeal and, you know, we've heard them make all sorts, but nothing like that. Mm-hmm. But it's been, it's been kind of a relief actually to sit down and talk about this with you today. Um, despite the fact that we've been friends all these years, it's something we haven't really sat down and discussed for a good couple of decades. And it's reassuring to me knowing that somebody else has remembered things in the same way and it's not something I've just sort of blown out of proportion in my head. Memories are funny old things. So thank you for sitting down with me today and sort of helping me piece the memories together. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. Because of everything that had happened and feeling like we had to be rid of that wooden horse, we talked to my mum about everything we'd experienced And as you may have gathered, she had some of her own things to add. To be honest, I was quite surprised to be taken so seriously. I was expecting an adult to brush it off and tell me it was just my imagination. But of course, I didn't know then how many times my mum has actually had a brush with the paranormal, whether she likes to admit it or not. In fact, not only did she take us seriously and completely understand the need to be rid of the horse, she rather shamefacedly pulled out some rocks that I hadn't seen before. She told me that she and my brother had collected them from the hill opposite the castle mound at Corf, and that although she had also noticed the atmosphere at Parnham and how things at the cottage seemed to change after our visit there, she felt it was also close enough to our visit to Corf Castle and bringing these rocks back to the cottage that she couldn't rule out her actions bringing these rocks back to be the culprit either. I was pretty taken aback at this turn of events. I hadn't even noticed her bringing the rocks down from the hill back at Corf. And looking at them now, I couldn't imagine why she had. They weren't pretty pebbles or fossils. They were just lumps of chalky rock. And it seemed rather out of character for her. To be honest, she seemed a little baffled by her actions herself. But obviously something had drawn her to them. When she held them out to me, I remember blurting out, they feel magnetic. Which isn't quite the right description, but the best my adolescent brain could muster at the time. They had a vibe to them, that's for sure. I remember it being similar to the static electric feeling I've become so familiar with in my years seeking out haunted places. The upshot of this discussion was essentially a consensus that we'd needed to return the rocks and be rid of the horse. The latter of which, I'm afraid, ended up in a public waste bin, which is a crying shame, really, if only for the beautiful wood and craftsmanship. But we didn't have things like haunted antique centres back then, and at the time, we just wanted it out of the house. So that's exactly what we did. And with the objects gone, lo and behold things went back to normal. It's almost a pity that we went belt and braces and removed the two things at the same time, as now we'll never know which it was that sparked the activity. Or maybe it was a combination of both. Who knows? 
But I did try and find some reason behind it all when writing this episode. In fact, I'd wanted for some time to do a whole episode on Parnham House, being as it left such an impression on me. But try as I might, and as much as I couldn't believe it, I wasn't able to find any recorded ghost sightings taking place at Parnham. Not one. Of course, you'd be completely entitled to wonder if my own para radar was simply having an off day and I'd got it all wrong. But I know that's not the case. I'd never felt so overwhelmed by the atmosphere of a house before I visited there. And we all felt it. So it really did seem impossible to me that I could find no trace of any paranormal happenings associated with the stately home. But to be honest, It was quite hard even to research the history of the house because as soon as I started looking, all I could find were the front page headlines, Parnham House Destroyed by Fire. This was actually rather shocking news to me as I hadn't exactly kept tabs on the place all these years and I'd had no idea that it had been gutted by a tremendous and mysterious blaze back in 2017. And it was quite horrifying seeing the pictures. The older news articles showed a blazing inferno, flames licking through centuries-old windows and pouring out of the roof. Later ones showed the charred ruins, the once magnificent home now a blackened shell. And the most recent ones showed nature starting to reclaim the property, greenery starting to climb through empty windows as the place stood empty awaiting rescue. It seemed like the building had made the headlines a lot, not just because of the fire, but also the mysterious circumstances surrounding the fire. One article even called the house cursed and made mention of Lady Strode, the Strode family being the original owners of the property and her brutal murder whilst defending the home during the Civil War in 1645. Curse or no, The fire was devastating. It took four days to put out, and one fire commander said it was the worst blaze he'd ever seen. The place was destroyed, and even now no one's really sure how much, if any of it, can be saved. Back in 2001, when the new owners, Michael and Emma Trichel, bought Parnham House from the make pieces, They poured £10 million into the house on restorations and turning it back into a family home. According to his friends, it was Michael's passion project. He was a rich man and had other properties, but those who knew him claimed his heart belonged to Parnham, which is why everybody was caught off guard when only days after the fire, Michael was arrested on suspicion of arson. Rumours abounded of gasoline cans being left strewn on the lawn, the horses having been inexplicably led out of their stables before the fire started. But the only thing that seems to have been confirmed by the lead fire investigations officer was that, because of the way the fire had ripped through the building and consumed the interior, looking for a source of accidental ignition inside the building was all but impossible. Whilst on bail, Trichel told the press, I am devastated at the loss of our home. The restoration of Parnham has been my life's work, and it's insane to think I could have destroyed it. Immediately after the fire, Michael returned to Parnham and was described by his wife as devastated. She told of him sobbing as he picked through the wreckage. He then went on TV vowing to rebuild the house. Of course, these could all be things that a guilty party might do as cover, but it's difficult to imagine somebody pouring so much money and effort into restoring a property, only to turn around and destroy it. Sadly, the tale of misfortune didn't end there. Only two months after the tragic fire at Parnham, And whilst its owner was still under police investigation for suspected arson, Michael was found drowned in Lake Geneva. His sudden death was widely supposed a suicide, 
and reports confirmed that there was nothing to raise suspicions about the manner of his passing. He was known to have been suffering severe depression, so this verdict went unquestioned by many, whilst others pointed out that he had been making plans for the future, and had even submitted plans to rebuild Parnham. Unfortunately, I can't give you a resolution to this story. The circumstances surrounding the fire are still unsolved. The case is listed as concluded, but not closed. It remains a cold case today, waiting for more evidence to come to light. Rumours still abound around the arson attack and the death of Michael. It seems the more you dig, the more the mystery deepens. I started to see why some were calling Parnham cursed, but it didn't bring me any closer to a reason for what we had experienced there. So I looked into the stones instead to see what mysteries I could uncover about the hill next to Corfe Castle. But as I said, this was a long time ago. I didn't know what the hill was called and I hadn't been up there myself. So to try and figure out which hill this was and what was so special about it, I looked into the geography of the landscape surrounding the castle and turned to my beloved OS maps to help me figure it out. As I mentioned in the last episode, Corfe Castle was built on the Purbeck Ridge, a steep-sided chalk ridge that dominates the landscape. This naturally elevated position is a perfect place to build a castle because of its defensive position and superb views across the landscape. But the Normans weren't the first people to appreciate the chalk ridgeway, and there had probably been some kind of stronghold or fortifications there long before William the Conqueror's son built his stone keep. And of course, fortifications weren't the only uses our ancient ancestors could think of for the highest points of the local area. And tall hills and ridges, with their proximity to the heavens and their commanding views across the landscape, were also popular places for prehistoric graves. I had an inkling before I even started looking, and pulling up the map of Corfe Castle, I could immediately see that the castle mott was nestled in a gap of the long ridgeway. So there are essentially two peaks either side of the ruins, named East Hill and West Hill. I didn't know which one of these my mum and brother had climbed, but it didn't really matter, as my suspicion was already proven. Regardless of which hill it was, they had started at the bottom of the mott and had a steep climb up the peak nearest the castle. At this point, on both East and the West Hill, was the map legend Tumulus. In other words, a prehistoric burial mound. In fact, looking along the ridgeway to both East and West, there were yet more tumuli scattered all along the chalk edifice. Further towards Swanage, an area on the map was marked as Nine Barrow Down, which, as the name suggests, is a series of burial mounds forming a Barrow Cemetery. It seems as though, for our Neolithic and Bronze Age ancestors, there was something very special and maybe sacred about this chalk ridgeway. I'm not sure what on earth had possessed my mum to pick up stones from here and take them home, of course, she had no idea there were burial mounds up there, and I'm sure if she'd known, then things would have played out differently. But even in her ignorance, it was out of character. And I have to wonder if something about the stones called out to her in some way. At any rate, I would never advise anyone to take stones from historic sites, no matter how appealing they are. And let this be a warning to you that if you do, you may get more than you bargained for. And if this rings any bells with anybody out there, then I can only suggest it's worth trying what we did and returning the item to its rightful home. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Do not steal bits of ancient monuments. I know, and I've issued so many warnings on this show, and, and then we find out that <laughs> we did it ourselves or completely by accident, and they were returned. Naughty Lils and Trevid Mum. I know. Naughty. Well, at least you took them back. I know. 
it is a shame, though, that you never figured out whether it was those or the horse that was causing the problem. No, I mean, there was definitely something about those stones and they needed to go back anyway. Um, but personally, I feel like it was Parnham. It felt almost like something followed us back. Like there was an, uh, some sort of claggy, horrible energy that just kind of descended as soon as we got there. And we just didn't shake it off until we got rid of the horse. Mm, and it was odd that it was in the gardens more than the house. Yeah, that was a bit strange. And specifically near this sort of pond or pool or whatever it was. I, I don't know. I don't know what happened at that place. Something just popped into my head. It's never happened before. Just like a, a, a phrase like that just coming out of nowhere. It's never happened again. Like my Gandalf voice on our first date. <laughs> it's a bit like that. But Mine, you, mine was a lot more, more sinister. pleasant. <laughs> yeah, well, this was way more sinister. <laughs> yeah, you, you've got a very sinister Gandalf. I've got, you know, happy Gandalf. Well, it, <laughs> it wasn't a voice in the same way that Gandalf came through. It was more of just a fact, like somebody had inserted mm. like a note in my head saying, you know, oh, by the way, <laughs> somebody drowned here. It was the strangest thing. That is a bit weird. It does seem odd that so much activity should surround something that was not exactly mass produced, wasn't exactly a one off either. It was like a, a gift shop trinket, effectively. Yeah, it was. And um, there was more than one item. I think there was more than one horse, although I'm struggling to remember. But yeah, there was several sort of carved animals and it just happened that I zoned in on that one. But I have a theory because, as you say, it's... It wasn't a one-of-a-kind piece. Mm. It wasn't something that somebody had spent countless man-hours. It wasn't an antique. It wasn't, you know, part of the original house or anything like that. However, I know that while the woodworking school was running, a lot of the items they produced were carved from wood felled on the property. And in fact, when we were walking around, I remember seeing the trees felled and stacked up in because they had various workshops and mm. things like that going on. And so... This horse could well have been made from a tree felled at Parnham that had been growing on that property for decades. Who knows? It's a shame it's so difficult to find out information about Parnham because I wonder if there was something that happened on the site that was sort of, you know, whether there's a battle or something, and obviously bodies tend to get left behind after yeah. a battle and then trees obviously absorb Bro, all the nutrients. Above from... those bodies yeah, possibly. So, yes, yeah. it's a shame that we couldn't perhaps figure out what had happened on the location before. But... No, I wish I'd bought a guidebook, but to be honest, I think I don't even remember whether there was a guidebook. They weren't very big on the history of the place when we visited because mm. it was mainly about the woodworking school and most of the information was pertaining to that, which is fair enough. But yeah, i I found it really difficult to find anything about the history of Parnham, but we know that it, there was a death there during the Civil War and the very fact that it existed during the Civil War and there obviously was fighting in the hmm. grounds, something happened there, you know, and well, it's not, just because there was a war going on doesn't mean that in the hundreds of years following there weren't other things that hmm. happened. We just don't know. Well, if you're a local Dorset historian and you do know, then yeah. get in touch and let us know. Please do. And that, I'm afraid, is all we have time for this episode. Thank you to everyone that shared their story with us. And don't forget that if you've got a story to share, please do get in touch through our website at notquantsvs.com. There you can also find links to all of our social media. So do pop along and follow those. Say hello and have a chat. Thank you again to our patrons whose support allows us to keep producing the show. And if you'd like to help support the show, please do consider becoming our patron, which you can do by following the links on our website or by visiting patreon.com forward slash K-O-F-Y. Your support doesn't have to be financial either. You can help us spread the word by recommending us to a friend, leaving us a review, subscribing to our YouTube channel, tweet about us, do a Facebook post recommending your favourite episode, or just leaving us a like on your favourite podcast player. Not Once For Yes is produced by my production company, Narrative Audio, and if you have a podcast and would like to outsource your editing and post-production, then please do get in touch, either through Not Once For Yes or narrativeaudio.com. Discounts are negotiable for anyone negatively affected by that which shall not be named. We hope that you'll join us again for some more spooky stories and haunted history 
on the next Knock Once for Yes. Can I pay for a 